Come on, come on. Welcome, everyone. This is Illiterate. This week, we are studying Jordan Peele's Nope. I just checked out the film, not in IMAX, unfortunately, but I did do Dolby Digital. I'm hanging out with Taylor. Hey, Evan. I checked out the oldest film of all time. Good God. We are we're going back, baby. If you haven't seen the film yet, and spoilers are important to you, we are going to be digging into a couple of the key pieces of iconography and the history of this thing, because we can't really do this particular show without really kind of like getting into the nitty gritty of it. Mm -hmm. But yeah, I'm excited because we're taking it all the way back. That's part of the whole movies. We're getting down to the beginning of cinema itself. Jordan Peele's first film since us. Yeah. I, I was definitely a little bit more interested in this going into it than perhaps maybe I was uh, for his other two films. Love his other two films. But this one really, I think, was the one I was kind of excited for. <laughs> yeah. Because he's playing with horror. He's playing with sci-fi, Western. Yeah. He's just taking a lot of stuff. But the central thematic elements, it's more about how spectacle can be people's downfall or that how we are drawn to maybe even Hollywood or what Hollywood it, missed when, yeah, that's the, the Moybridge stuff, which we'll get into is. Exactly. We're going to yeah. explore the Moybridge connection, which is really at the root of all of this stuff, the beginning of cinema. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, I, I, feel, I see the, the reactions. I think generally people are liking the film, but I think there has been a little bit, bit polarization in terms of maybe not leading you to a concerted point. Which, yeah. you know, I'm like, no, this is all like pretty earthy stuff to just kind of meditate on and think about. I don't know that I, yeah. you know, like I think the entire film, I I got this notion as if I was coming to a a thought the moment he wanted me to think it, which is really rare when you're paying attention to his screenplay. <laughs> and that's is the mark of a really amazing screenplay. And then when I got to the end, I was left meditating on it. And I felt as if I walked hand in hand right through exactly what I was supposed to be thinking and feeling. <laughs> yeah. So I, I, I was let, look, just supposed with all of the reactions, I wasn't, I'm confused as where people thought they were led astray or like it didn't, yeah. you know, like I, it, you know, so there's a lot to, to get into. Some of that interested me with the, with the title, the, the title note <laughs> he had said, what he wanted the audience reaction to be moments in the film, which is a weird yeah. title to give, yeah. <laughs> you know, uh, <laughs> speaking to sort of the spoon feeding kind of what it's about. Do you know what the original title of this was? No, not, not at all. Like we talked about, it's a, it has to do with the spectacle and the maybe abuse of that for people's gain. And everybody's different view of spectacle. Mm -hmm. It's everybody's got a different thing that's drawn them in. And it might be, it's a little different for you. It's a little different for me. I think it definitely has that notion in there as well. Yeah. <laughs> but the original title was Little Green Men, which I liked because it's about <laughs> the alien presence and then also the guys on the money in the US. <laughs> I, I I just love titles that's <laughs> like good. that. Yeah. Yeah. But he's like it it casts it in a different light and it isn't really on his brand as much. You know, and it, it, it it's honestly Nope is an interesting title. It's an odd title, but when you get to the moments in the film when it's actually in genuine reaction, it's it's genuine, authentic <laughs> and funny. It yeah. works without overstepping and breaking any kind of dramatic line. So, you know, I think it's a really brilliant title, to be honest, in terms yeah. of it's odd, but I think it really works without becoming a dumb joke or cliche of itself. Right, right. Let's uh, jump into some of the production stuff, a little bit of the influences, and then we'll get into the old movie history just to get a taste yeah. of why he did this. Wrote in 2020, worried about the future of cinema. And so that's why he wanted to make something a little different, a bigger spectacle, sci-fi alien flick. Yeah, bigger the, genre the, piece. Mm -hmm, yeah. Mm -hmm. And the big thing about it too was everybody being trapped inside, artistic notion to make something about the sky and the expanse and the vastness and what's out there and all of that because mm -hmm. of being locked in. So the influences then, some are pretty apparent because of the addiction to spectacle and creature feature stuff, King Kong, Jurassic Park, mm -hmm. which if you're interested, we have episodes on both of those properties, which I'll <laughs> put links to in the show notes as to what he's interested in, as well as something that I found that I don't think a lot of people do is the 
physics research behind it. So one of the consultants on the film was a Caltech professor, mm. John O. DeBiri, I believe is how you say his last name, aeronautics engineer, but then also wow. known for his, his main research is on the hydrodynamics of jellyfish propulsion, which oh, wow. is like what a, what a specific person to yeah. then <laughs> consult on this sort of floating, spoiler, spoiler, jellyfish-esque creature in the sky. But he really helped on sort of the fishy design of the UFO, wow. how something could hide in the clouds, the electrical propulsion, because there's actually a wind farm that he helped, which is adapted from the schooling dynamics of fish. Just crazy that, I don't know. Interesting. And we should yeah. mention, because this is all b born out of all of the revelation from the Navy footage, which we covered in the UFO right. episode. Um, so he's, again, that's another big thing that has, it was on everyone's mind, you know, two, three, four years ago, that it, finally we're getting to see a, a filmmaker with some big financing to get a look at, you know, try <laughs> right. to explain these types of things. And I really enjoyed seeing the the famous iconography of the craft and then it to evolve into something else and to present a notion of it of a different type of propulsion was really interesting is it like <laughs> oh yeah that is it like christopher nolan like this is how it works no but like it's it was certainly right. interesting <laughs> yeah and the I, the concept what you're talking about ufo versus uap oh no it's not a ship with things in it it's a thing it is it a is creature. a thing yeah <laughs> so i'll post a i'll post a link to the interview with this guy i was Marvel yeah, man. that's sick. Um, but yeah, that's one amazing. of the other things in terms of reality. I mean, I mean, before we, I just yeah, yeah. before we move off of it, in terms of a cinema thing too, if he's focused on cinema and he's focused on where cinema is in its state, it was to see it unfold and develop from a saucer to something else. I think was part of the prize notion here. It's like let's mm -hmm. we can think of these things in other ways. It was not lost on me. I don't know. Maybe, <laughs> hey, maybe I'm just making up stuff here. <laughs> oh, it's the it's the spectacle for sure, and how it draws people in before it kills them. Speaking of reality killing, Gordy the ape, the chimpanzee, rather. Yeah. People didn't say, but there was a a somewhat based in reality situation related to this. There wasn't such a graphic thing as a TV set gone awry. Right. Right. But there was a, a actual chimpanzee, Travis the chimpanzee. This couple in Connecticut had it in 2009. This situation happened, but they got it. You know, it was wearing clothes and eating at the dinner table and slept in bed right. with them. They had it since it was a baby, since 1995. And then oh, just gosh. did what a wild animal would do. People were not aware of that this was going to happen. And it m completely mauled their friend, Charla Nash. Gosh. And there's footage because she ended up going on Oprah Winfrey. She had tons of facial reconstructive surgery, yeah. but she's very disfigured and was talking about it and propose, you know, don't have wild animals and all of this stuff because it just completely Gosh. snuck up on them, quote unquote. But it's like you have a, a wild chimpanzee in your house in Connecticut. So that's the closest thing I could find where this sort of thing, of course, the Siegfried and Roy, you know, tiger right. situation, but an actual chimp that seems docile and works with people and wearing clothes and all of that stuff, tragedy strikes. Uh, yeah, they mentioned somewhat. Siegfried and Roy by name, actually, by the, mm. by the third act. Um, that was certainly a, a shocking element that I didn't expect going into this type of genre film exactly, to take it outside of the, the world of extraterrestrial, mm -hmm. to make your point about you know, spectacle that has nothing to do with other life. It has to do very much with present life <laughs> in our current <laughs> reality and communication. And there's a lot of, I mean, the whole notion here between the, tr the horse trainers and training the animal and being able to communicate and form a rapport with that animal relating to what uh, the cowboy thinks he's, you know, what meditation connection he is forming with the chimp as it looks in its eyes for the final moments. Mm -hmm. um, I just didn't expect the viciousness uh, and the and really the <laughs> kind of the reality of that. I was, I was ready to go alien. You know, I was ready to yeah, go yeah. experience something beyond. Um, you know, he had an experience with the the unexplained, you know, yeah, like yeah. I was ready. And then it was just this absolutely vicious, real thing. In the middle of it, you have the the image of the shoe 
standing yeah. on its own, which I that is still something that I'm I'm meditating on and thinking about. <laughs> Perhaps that is exactly the point is to have yeah. me focused in and thinking about it. So it, it's just a very, very peculiar piece. I think it's certainly <laughs> polarized a lot of people, but I, I thought it to be really effective uh, to really bring you in on these different shades of spectacle and what draws you in uh, mm-hmm. and how people uh, you know process that. Uh, how people exude that through their life, the echoes of that. And uh, it, it was pretty interesting stuff. Um, oh, definitely. Definitely. I think the spectacle thing, too, that he's playing with also, he, he always, Jordan Peele, that is, has some sort of hidden, forgotten, you should know about this. <laughs> you should be thinking right. about this. And the the big one, of course, which everyone saw in the original trailer, is the historical stuff, where this family right. originates and that interested me a great bit in the research. I don't know if you had any experience with this or Moybridge is the guy's name. All I know is just that imagery and that name. Right. I mean, we had, we, we briefly touched on it first year in film school, you know, just the birth of moving images, but we never really got into Moybridge himself. Certainly never gave it a second thought as to who was in the image or like, well, whose horse is that? You know, like I've never, you know, like that never occurred to me. Um, So a fascinating idea that, you know, that the, that an African-American jockey and riding a horse is the first image really captured moving at all ever. So they're intrinsic linked with the birth of cinema uh, that's a really fun place to start with your characters and where would you find them in 2022 if you purport that they are the descendants of that jockey and now maybe they're on the cusp of getting proof of uh, extraterrestrial life that's <laughs> That's a fun movie. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So uh, I was, and it's, you know, if you're worried about the history of cinema and where we're going, you know, like, it, it, you know, I don't know that it's, uh, do we need an answer to it? But like, <laughs> it's, it's certainly, you know, he's helped blowing the winds in the directions he wants to see and the things he's interested in. I, I, I was just delighted by the, the ponderance of it all. <laughs> yeah. So I, I, I was pondering it. I went down the rabbit hole and found quite a lot of curiosities and oddities and just, I think, we're watching stuff on our phones while we poop and we have no idea <laughs> how it started, <laughs> you know? Yeah. So I think no that context for anything. Yeah. Worth bringing in the, the great, great, great grandfather is made up in terms of, they don't know who the person is, but there is the real yeah. film with a horse named Annie G ridden by an unidentified black jockey. I will say the, the, the official first of his is called Sally Gardner at a gallop, which is the name of the horse and not the person. Hmm. That is allegedly this person, Gilbert Dom, who was an employee at the stables. And there are these other ones that are in silhouette that may have been a black jockey, but we don't know. The one that Jordan Peele uses in the film itself is identified seven years later from the original stuff, just because it's crisper. It's a better photo. Hmm. And this one is called Annie G with male rider. And it's definitely a black jockey in that one. So it's like Mm -hmm. a little bit of a fudging because it's not the actual first one, but the first one kind of sucks as a picture. So he's Uh, using the one where you can clearly identify who it is. But in all of them, we don't really know anyways. And if you go back and listen to our Concrete Cowboy episode, we talk a lot about the history of cowboys, horse racing, and how the entire sport was ruled by black jockeys and was completely taken yeah. over and so that's another thing i'll put in the show notes as far as like all of that that forgotten history but as far as the motion picture side of things just back to the very very beginning the start blew my mind for what if you were trying to get motion pictures of things what would it be for it wasn't mm-hmm. entertainment it was the pursuit of science the 1840s there they used some almost more like stop motion type stuff, tracing the indications of meteorological equipment or its early photos were posed and then you'd move and then pose again because the exposure time is too long. 
So that's well, where it's it like got think about out. trying to understand how a horse gallops. <laughs> right, right. You can't slow it down or stop it. You've never seen it. You know, you don't have the. You can't manipulate time and space. <laughs> inside yeah. Of uh, you know, so you know, but you're trying to understand how all four legs move in conjunction. And is there is you off the ground all at the same time? You know, you're like, and to how many times do you have to run by to see that flicker of the right? So that's you know the, that's the idea of understanding 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 the motion of how how does a horse move what's happening with the muscle systems here so yes yeah. <laughs> that was uh that was at the heart of some of this <laughs> yeah exactly so that's it's a it's a natural curiosity and as the technology develops moybridge comes in 1873 he's commissioned by this guy leland stanford whose name you know what he's done but not who he is Ooh. he was an industrialist which is the nice way of saying robber baron of the time. He (laughs) was the former governor of California when it was first becoming a state and just a a guy who's wackadoodle about horses. He has tons of land and horses and all that. And so this was commissioned because of his own curiosity about horse gait analysis. There's apocryphal stuff that it was a bet about whether or not it was all four legs off, but that's not substantiated. But it is substantiated. I like to believe curious. that. That's yeah. fun. Yeah, <laughs> it is fun. Also because he has tons of money. And I imagine it like the rich guys. Yeah. Right? I, exactly. I imagine like the rich guys in rat race, like betting on like, yeah, yeah. What, what is the outcome? <laughs> yeah. And so the name Leland Stanford, the reason you know him is because he also founded Stanford University in California. Ooh, wow. Yeah. So he's done, he's done other stuff, but he's the guy who's responsible for like, does a horse, how does it move? I want to know. So- he got he got a photo of the horse in flight because of the ability of the exposure by this guy Moybridge and he's like I want to see it all I want it all at full speed this just led me down this trail of well how the heck did he who's Moybridge how did this guy get yeah. into and why does he have the credentials to make this happen and how's he right. the guy who started all this stuff you know it's unfortunate. How was he because, in the place and the time, and how was he yeah, the dude? How did yeah. a thumb of history <laughs> land on him? <laughs> because it's interesting, and you know, it's unfortunate that it's like I, tr- I tried to look in, and that's the point of Nope is like we don't have anything about the jockeys at all. There is some about Moybridge, but he's an equally fascinating, esoteric, sort of awkward person in history. That mm-hmm. I said, well, let's. I don't know that yeah. either. I know as much about the jockey as I do about the guy behind the camera, and right. so we have some information on him. So here we go. Weird old Edward. Originally, his <laughs> name is Edward Muggeridge, and he uh, wanted just to change his name to be more classically British because that's where he's from. And so he said, "I'm Moybridge now." Uh, he landed on Moybridge. Yeah, yeah. One well, Edward. He also <laughs> he could have spells chose anything. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's kind of similar. It's fine. It's just <laughs> I, it doesn't. You know, like it would never. I would never look at it and go like, huh chose that you know yeah they changed their name but anyway i guess it's better than muggeridge uh, yeah i mean i did upgrade i've just been like <laughs> hey you know go for something real he could have <laughs> make loving you know yeah or the, whatever the name of the king was or you know yeah any of that um but yeah he moved to the u.s at 20 and was sort of american dream all over the place was in new york new orleans california right after it became a state Ooh. the big thing he was doing was selling books and photographs more of a businessman, salesman type thing, running various mm-hmm. shops and whatnot. At the age of 30, this is his inflection point, horrible, horrible head injury from a runaway stagecoach, which killed the driver wow. and one mm-hmm. passenger. And then everybody else was wounded, including him. This happened in Texas, and he woke up nine days later in a hospital in Arkansas. It I'm was, just uh, considering the horror of what would be a runaway stage. I just, I've yeah. never th- really thought about it. I get like Ta- a lot of horses that has a bit yeah. like, like, oh my god, that would be absolutely horrifying. Yeah, <laughs> there's and a so, stampede coming down the street with an irate horse and a giant house it's towing, <laughs> <laughs> filled with people. Yeah, it uh, this oh really affected him. There's, it's interesting. It's used because it was. I guess somewhat documented because of also then what happened in the rest of his life. Modern psychologists have a good look at kind of what happened and they believe it was his orbitofrontal cortex that was damaged thereafter because from here on out, he's almost a different person. He has extremely emotional eccentric behavior, but Mm -hmm. also his creative freedom 
and his lack of interest in any sort of social conventions, he's almost gone from businessman to crazy artist in the, overnight. And so he just goes off the rails in terms of everything <laughs> he's doing. He's just like, Lord. I'm going to start inventing stuff and travel even more. He patented this plate printing method, this apparatus for clothes washing. And in this span of time thereafter, after 30 years old, his whereabouts are quite murky. Like he shows up on records <laughs> investing in this mining company in Texas. But then shortly after, he's also invested in this bank in Turkey. And so oh, Lord. He's, he's literally all over oh, the Lord. world inventing oh, no. and, and, and yeah, eventually, <laughs> knows, when he, you know, like, yeah, yeah, <laughs> what he got into. <laughs> well, moving um, on. <laughs> he gets back to California and his friends, like I said, eccentric artists don't even recognize him. He's careless about his appearance. He's agitated and then forgot like anything even happened. He wow. has no business. I mean, near death experiences, yeah. man. I get, get like, some, I maybe it's just, I'm just. You get a sense that time is short, end is nigh. You only yeah. have so much time. Am I wasting time? I got to do stuff. I don't know. That's well, yeah, I mean, stab in the dark. Even more that his brain, like the neurology, changed. Like That's I said, what I the, mean. The, yeah, yeah, no, it's, yeah. it's like he has a f actual, like a for real, Im physical impairment that sped that up. Uh, it, that's oh god. Changed his personality. Yeah, to the point where yeah. he even refused payment from clients if they thought his work wasn't beautiful. Like if they still wanted it, but he was like, "Well, no, I do that." It's art. So, yeah. No, just... <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Speaking of other stagecoaches, carriages, he made a portable dark room out of a horse carriage, and painted the words "Helios's Flying Studio" on the back, and changed his name again. He identified as Helios, which is a oh. Greek god. No, really going Let's into go his back to Moy Bridge. <laughs> <laughs> his uh, his artistic period. He also started editing photos, like oh lord, almost like photo, like he's adding clouds, moons, volcanoes, like really getting into the artistic effect of what he's doing. Taking that stage tons and coast tons just of hit him with a <laughs> smack full of genius. Like, <laughs> smack full of genius. He's yeah, just yeah. Uh, he's just on all cylinders now. Yeah. And he's getting bigger work. He's taking photos in Yosemite, huge risks, because there's photos showing him sitting on a rock with just 2,000 feet of dead space below him, could easily fall to his death. He's commissioned by the US government to photograph the new Alaska territory. So he's all over okay, the place. Okay, how do you get that gig, though, if you're that unstable? Like, I. <laughs> <laughs> Because he's, just, he's he's putting out good work. Because he's you know? the only one who would do. Yeah, yeah he's got the. <laughs> oh my god! Yeah. So what got him noticed then by Stanford is remember he's in the business scene. He was the governor of California, etc. Uh, Moybridge had taken photos of the creation, the structure building of the San Francisco Mint, documenting the process over time, which is almost like a time lapse in a mm -hmm. way of all these different setups. So that's how he gets on with Leland because he saw that and said, wow, this guy is in the scene. He's doing interesting stuff. He's got the equipment and the technical prowess. He's invented stuff. Yeah. And so then that's how Leland gets the horse photos. And then, like I said, at the beginning, he's like, I want the whole sequence. Can you figure out how to take a picture okay. yeah. and a bunch of pictures? Plot twist. This is the best part for me. Mm. So, 1874, this is a year after the horse stills that he gets for Stanford. Moybridge finds out that his wife, which I don't know, I mean, he's all over the place. He's traveling all over the place. He disappears for months at a time. She, he finds out that she's been having an affair with one of their friends, Harry Larkins. And remember, oh. I said Moybridge is kind of unstable. His emotions are all over the place oh, and no. he doesn't recognize it. He goes to this guy's job in Napa says, I have a message for you from my wife and shoots him point blank. Good God. Oh my Murder. God. Murder. Just, Lord and then apologizes mercy. to the other people in the room for disturbing them and just walks out. Excuse me. <laughs> yeah. Didn't mean to Sorry startle about. you. Yeah, that's it. <laughs> Immediately on trial. I mean, this is for the time also quite a crazy God. situation. Not that he's that well known, but it's just like, what a bizarre God. tabloid circumstance. Oh my gosh. Although it's weird because he does have somewhat of like a progressive conscience. He stands up for this Chinese man being accosted while he's in jail, argues against other 
people in jail using profanity like he has this weird conscience about him in prison that was that was noted i, I would is, not want to have wanted to have been in the cell next to him <laughs> Jeez, oh, God. oh that would have been rough yeah so the the outcome of this case and this is really what what sealed it for me the lawyer pleaded insanity due to the stagecoach all this stuff there's Whoa. evidence what has happened uh, Moybridge undercuts this by saying, no, this was deliberate. It was premeditated. I, I knew what I was doing. Like, <laughs> no, that's my favorite part. I like that. This is <laughs> right. The lawyer throws all his documents into the air <laughs> and sits down. <laughs> Although I guess, you know, I don't know what, what, how it ended up working out between them because maybe it helped. He was acquitted for, and this is a bizarre thing that I guess I didn't really have a lot of precedent. The jury said we acquit him under this idea of justifiable homicide, which is kind of like why <laughs> laws are are around. Like there is no so just, crazy like, or not. They just agreed with him. <laughs> so they said it was not based on law, but based on human nature. And they're like, we cannot punish a person for doing something we as a jury would also rightfully do in that situation. That's crazy. Why I have never heard that in any kind of formal <laughs> like law critique. Any I I am the jury said, and I'm. When was the last time you ever heard of that? <laughs> makes all? no I've sense. Never heard. Of, oh my God, <laughs> they, everyone they just all looked at each other and went, "Yeah, I would have done it too." Yeah, the same thing, brother. You know. Like, Wow. I'm like, I'm like under, I'm just, they dug into who the other guy was and he was even worse than just, I don't you know, know, what I, you know, I don't know. Oh God. So oh Lord, I, I mean, he got through it. it. Yeah. <laughs> so acquitted, crazy acquitted. or not, didn't matter. Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Actually, wait, was he, and it might be my favorite part because if, yeah they had be believed he was crazy then that works against him they had to believe it was no i did it on purpose yeah exactly Righte righteous indignation yeah that is what got him off i know that's what i'm saying it's, it's bizarre that's incredible so the weird the weirdest <sighs> sidetrack middle section but like i said stanford is like what about the the horse moving thing <laughs> so that was sort of put on hold in this and then in, in spite of all of this happening, Moybridge had prepared for a photography trip that he was going to take to Central America. So he just took it anyways after and was gone for like months in Central America. And in this time, all the photographs that are credited to him, he had changed his name again to Eduardo Santiago Moybridge. And so all of the photos there you are I think credited. it's the same Moybridge, sir? <laughs> yeah. And it's like, not to make light of it, he probably has some sort of serious mental condition that that was coming from this situation. But it is interesting, too, because it's like, with his ubiquity and notoriety in the media, like I'm saying, modern neuroscientists, all of the court proceedings are available. He's cataloged going places and doing things. It's kind of still utilized in modern medical practice to understand what happened to this person. So that's kind of interesting as well. That it's not yeah. just for nothing. Eventually, like I said, he goes back to Stanford, creates this apparatus of a bunch of cameras along a track with electromagnetic shutters triggered by tripwires, and we get to see finally the horse uh, in full motion. So it's, yeah, he just invented something, figured it out, put it together, and it was, it was shocking because the poses were not how people had painted them. It seemed a lot less graceful, and the whole thing of the legs being crunched under is where it's hovering and the legs being out are touching the ground was mm -hmm. the opposite. People always painted them with legs flung out floating and not, and not right. the other way around. He does a bunch of stuff, ends up going back to England, dies at his cousin's house while he was excavating a scale model of the American Great Lakes in the backyard. And good God, the coup de grace of the whole thing there's a reason I mentioned all his name stuff. His name is misspelled on his gravestone. It says Maybridge no. instead of Moybridge. Uh, yeah. So oh that's my God. Uh, what a well, <laughs> what a life. What a fascinating. Uh, I mean, 
Good God. I, <laughs> wow. Yeah, just certainly didn't learn all that in film school. My God. Yeah. Oh, so um, he's responsible for then – I mean, everybody then after is like, oh, yeah, we can use a camera and we can, you know, take – quicker pictures and you know there's all there in germany there's a guy automar anschutz who's developing projection technology and they're using right iterations of it's it was funny looking into this there's like a million inventions there's the mutoscope and the idoloscope and the phantom right. phantasmoscope and like you know the, the kinetoscope which is Edison's off of thing. this yeah. yeah yeah it's seriously the ideas explode i mean and that's we try to study kind of those things a little bit here throughout the series of just how thought and putting things out into the <laughs> into the ether <laughs> can grow and expand and come full circle and 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 take you down places you never even thought about i mean just that one little thing i mean this ignited the image the idea of the mm -hmm. image what how ma image could be manipulated and we're still we're still investigating <laughs> well, and isn't it um, even at the end of the film they kind of harken back to Moybridge yeah. and his and his practice in a way? Exactly. That, uh, if I, is that yeah? Well, the Moybridge connection is heavy throughout the film. Um, you know, they they explain it pretty heavily right up at the beginning. You know, they're on set for a commercial uh, where they explain their lineage and show that the footage. I think in a square off to the side. Um, and yeah. I, I should mention that our friend Oz Perkins uh, from our uh, Gretel and Hansel episode uh -huh. played the director in that scene. So it was a delight oh. to see our <laughs> friend yeah, on yeah. the screen there. Uh, go check out that episode. So if you want to hear about him, his influences and, uh, you know, yeah, horror, different horror, um, yeah. different horror. Uh, but, uh, the Moybridge connection is really is is heavy throughout the entire thing. It gets down to the end sequence uh, when the main character is trying to use one of the flash photography cameras set in a well at the Jupiter Ranch. The thing that she has to crank while the creature is overhead that they've lured in a specific position. Mm -hmm. um, and and a, a bigger connection even then is uh, at the end our uh, Quint. Uh, or <laughs> from Jaws, right, right. if you will, comes in. He is the big filmmaker who has this incredible contraption built off of an IMAX camera and everything that harkens back to Moybridge's uh, electricity-less camera. So he's <laughs> right. cranking the footage through no electricity. It's the key. So this Moybridge connection, as we did throughout the entire thing, the idea of the moving image, um, this is this is what the, the film is concerned with with and where cinema might be going next what are our interests what are you know yeah but it's pretty it's it's pretty thick in here this morbid stuff and the inception of cinema and our interpretation of story the notions here going forward of well what does genre look like and what who can lead a film like this and what does mm -hmm. you know what i mean uh, it, yeah. it's pretty uh it's pretty important stuff and this morbid stuff i think is really great to bring to the foreground to really expand and pick apart a little bit i mean gosh like i said i went to four years in film school <laughs> and i had no idea that the guy had, had such a life uh <laughs> right it only makes sense that's like what film has become has started with such an eccentric literally knock in the head change the world kind of thing right for this, for this one guy yeah it's Gosh, cool yeah just smacked it, smacked in the head with genius and in right. somewhere down the line hundreds of years because of the invention of the moving image um, now we're studying jordan peele's film nope <laughs> yeah <pretty hot. laughs> um no thank you taylor incredible yeah, work yeah, this thank week you. thank you guys for sticking with us uh, we really appreciate it reach out to us at illiterate pod on instagram uh illiteratepod at gmail.com for the email. Please let us know what you're excited about coming up in the future and uh, just maybe we will do it as an episode and get you all the facts you want to know. Well, we can't wait to see you right back here next week, y'all. Until then, stay safe, stay happy, and let's learn, baby. All right. All right. <laughs> see you later.